Alan, I don't know if we have the outline from last week still, if we can uh, pull that up. I hadn't, it's kind of strange. It's all, it's a narrative, right? We're going from chapter to chapter, and, but unfortunately I have lessons that are arranged um, in nice compartmentalized sections, and it doesn't always work out like that. So uh, that was the title of the message last week. However, so if you want to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, I would appreciate that. We did not finish. I left out uh, some concluding thoughts on the second point, and not the, we didn't deal with the third point at all. So the first point under 2 Kings chapter 6 was Elisha gets himself into a predicament. Uh, you remember that the king of Assyria was uh, uh, convinced that he had a traitor in his midst. Somebody was telling them their, their uh, uh, location of their troops and their tactics. And, and it seems like the, the, the nation of Israel knew everything they were going to do. And someone said, there's not a traitor here. The problem is that man of God, that prophet, Elisha, uh, he's telling them everything that you're going to do. He knows everything you say, even what you say in your bedchamber. All of your most secret thoughts are being revealed. Of course, the king of Assyria didn't like that. And he uh, immediately sent a group to find out where he was. And they besieged the city. It was a city called Dothan. And he's in this predicament where the Assyrian army has surrounded him. By the way, he didn't have access to his own army. The, Isra the Israeli army was not there. They were running from the Assyrians. They were greatly outnumbered. So he's there with one servant in the city, and his servant goes outside to perhaps prepare breakfast or take care of some details, and he sees the Assyrians encamped around the city waiting for the sun to come up, and he's in a panic mode. And I was going to relate that to our, our response to those who find themselves in a true crisis. By the way, that's someone, that's someone that you're thinking about that you may have to help one day down the road. Maybe you, <laughs> maybe you as well. You may find yourself in a crisis, but there's a wonderful uh, uh, approach that Elisha took to this unnamed servant uh, that t teaches us a lot about how we can deal with uh, those supposed problems that come into our lives. So I'm gonna pick it up. Let's see, we're in verses 16 of chapter 6, 2 Kings chapter 6, and look at verse 16. Actually, let's go back to verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, unto Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And what are we going to do? It's a, he's in a panic mode. And he, Elisha, answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. We have a song based upon that line. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So there are three things that Elisha did that we can do in helping people through these crises events that come into their lives or to deal with them ourselves. But the first thing that he did was, he demonstrated genuine concern, and he did that by saying those two words, fear not. So when you hear people that you know and love, or even strangers that are going through a, a time of a real crisis, and they're in these, a situation, a desperate situation, like this servant saw himself in, the best thing we can do is offer words of encouragement. Go to them. Before you ask about all the details, before you try try to give uh, solutions to their problem or to help them fix whatever's wrong in their lives, we should perhaps start by just saying, hey, you know what? It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. God is in control here. Everything's going to be all right. And offer that um, emotional support that people need. Sometimes, at least temporarily, that's the best thing we can do. Don't prejudge them. Uh, don't... Uh, Try to find the reason why they find themselves in that situation. Don't offer your uh, opinions about how they can get out of it right away. But just come to the person and say, hey, you know, don't worry. This is going to get better. You know, things are going to improve. And they always are going to improve. So we need to offer that emotional support that's needed. Then, second, he gave biblical instruction to why he should not be afraid. It's one thing to say, hey, don't worry. It's, everything's going to be okay. It's another thing to say, and I'll tell you why it's going to be okay. Because God has promised in his word, da -da 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 -da, whatever, you're, whatever they're going through, by giving biblical. In this case, he said, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them, which was true. He didn't see it yet, 
But uh, I can think of any number of good Bible verses you might share to people going through a crisis. You probably should find something that uh, pertains to their particular need. Let's say they have, um, uh, they're having difficulty in their marriage. You know, you can go back and say, God has ordained marriage. God has designed a plan by which people can work through their problems and, and try to give them some biblical admonition about marriage and, and to try to, if they have a wayward child, you need to come and say, you know, God's, God said in his word that children are an heritage of the Lord and that if we train them right, they will not leave the path that we have set for them. Even when we fail, and we are, we're not perfect, right, as parents, God's grace will cover a multitude of sins in people's lives. The third thing he did is he began to pray for his servant. In, in, in particular, he prayed, the Bible says, open his eyes. So that is a good three-part response that we should take to people going through a crisis. Go to them, encourage them emotionally. Let them know you're with them, you're going to help them, that God's going to see them through. Give them a biblical reason why God can help them and how he will help them. And then when you leave that setting I pray for them. Sometimes it's good to pray for them before you've even offered any solutions to their problem. And I have found, we, on pastoral staff, that we don't, have a, we don't have a solution to everybody's problems. We don't have a quick solution to most of the problems that people have. But we got to start somewhere. And that, that focus begins to change to God, and then our eyes will be open and we shall see. So that's a good response to take to this particular situation. Now, I didn't give you the last point of that outline, which is Elisha is delivered from the enemy. Uh, that begins in verse number 18. And when Elisha came down, uh, it says, And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. What is Samaria? Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. So this uh, Syrian army uh, surrounds this small town of Dothan. It, it, it makes reference here to people, but these people are soldiers. They're those who have encamped around the city. They're there to arrest and to get Elisha and bring them back to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. And God smote them with blindness. I can just imagine this scene, this uh, well-trained, well-armed army uh, going against Elisha and his servant, and they're blind, and he says, uh, here, follow me, I'll take you to the person you're looking for. Who was the person they were looking for? Elisha. <laughs> I'm the person you're looking for. I could just imagine these soldiers perhaps joining hand in hand. I looked on a map. I wondered how far they traveled to get to uh, where they ultimately ended up, which was uh, the capital city of the Northern Empire. Uh, where the king, Jehoram, was, and the, best, the last of his troops, um, you know, they were holed up there trying to hide out from the uh, Syrian army. And here these guys, they're blind, and he's leading them uh, from Dothan to the capital city there, a distance of about, it's the, from Samaria to Dothan, of about seven miles. Now, if David Lyon were to run that distance, he'd probably get there in about... <laughs> 45 minutes, uh, but these are, these are blind guys that are probably hand in hand, you know, fumbling through, you know, if you, you want to try this at home, put a blindfold on and try to go to an un, unfamiliar territory and see how long it takes you to get there. It's just, it's slow going. I don't know. It must have taken them hours to get there. And they, they finally get into the, to the, to the capital there and uh, Samaria, and then God opens their eyes and they suddenly realize that they're in the middle of the city of the Northern Empire. They're captive. They're prisoners. <laughs> They've been tricked. And I could just imagine what was going through their minds as they, their sight, I'm sure they're glad to have their sight restored, but here they are. And Jehoram, the king of the Northern Empire, immediately begins to make plans to have all these soldiers killed, which would factor into this next, next lesson. So keep that in mind. His intent was to, here they were, God intervened, Elisha led them, wisely led the whole army right into their city. He was probably lining up the executioners to have them all killed on the spot. And Elisha said, no, 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 this is, that's not what we're going to do. And God has 
been gracious this day. You know, they were coming to have Elisha taken and I'm sure killed. And he understood that. He understood the context of what was going on. And he said, give them something to eat and feed them and send them on their way. What an interesting thing. Uh, Jehoram objected to that, but that is ultimately what they ended up doing. And I, I begin to think through that reasoning there. I mean, in other battles, there were, there were fatalities. And that's how, that's how war goes. People die. And you're, uh, the object of war is to defeat the enemy. Why would God allow those, after marching them blind all the way to this capital city of Samaria, why would God allow them to then go back home after being fed and given provisions, water, and then send them back home? I think God was teaching a lesson to both the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, and also to the wicked king Jehoram. He was trying to perhaps teach him something about demonstrating grace, about honoring God about doing the right thing and about a God of second chances. And um, uh, although I'm sure that's not exactly what Jehoram would have done, that's ultimately what ended up happening. And uh, they did go back home. And the Bible says following that, there's a period, a relative period of peace in the nation of Israel. They, the, the Syrians stopped pursuing them, at least them. Maybe God was giving Ben-Hadad a chance to think over his decisions. You could have lost your whole army. They were, they were in the, they'll tell you, they were in the enemy camp. They could have all been killed, but I, I spared their lives. What, what can we take from this portion of the story? When you remember that the truth of the promise is that God is going to watch over us and protect us, even when we don't see his hand in our lives. The servant didn't know that this host, there was a, an enemy, a great enemy encamped around the city, but there was a larger host of God, an angelic host there, who could have do, done God's bidding. I don't know how much you think about or are um, consumed with the thought of guarding angels, the way that some of you live. You probably need a little more care than others, I would suppose. But um, uh, the Bible nevertheless does teach that God watches over his children through a, a variety of means. And it may well be that God watches over us more than we know and has watched over us. I've been involved in three, what could have been easily, a fatal car accidents. Could have been fatal car accidents. In fact, some of them, I don't know how I didn't, and literally walked away from them. I was involved in a, in a wreck with a van that flipped over several times on a highway uh, up in snowy Oregon. And there were, the man had a toolbox in the back of the van. Uh, by the way, I, the children are not here, I can say this. I was sleeping in the bench seat without my seatbelt on. <laughs> You know, I was tired. I was asleep. I was laying full. I was fast asleep. Well, he tried to pass a truck. His wheels began to skid. When they finally caught, he was heading to the bank, and we just flipped over. And the man's tools from the back were, I remember, flying through the air all over the place and landing on everything. His toolbox, is, that's how vicious that wreck was. And um, ironically, the van uh, landed upright after flipping over three or four times. It landed upright. And we all walked out of that um, wreck without so much as a Band-Aid. I mean, I, can, I don't know how to explain that. I, I, I can, I only, I've always thought, maybe I'll know when I get to heaven, that God's guarding angels watched over us. I was involved in another wreck. with a, a, Again, I wasn't driving. Of course, I would never drive this way. People I'm with driving in the car flipped over twice. And uh, we just walked out of it. I had a little shock. I didn't, I didn't know how to talk. I couldn't talk temporarily. I was sort of in shock, but I didn't have even a, a, a cut on my body. Walked away from that. You know, God watches over us in a lot of different ways. I, my favorite story of God's intervention in my life is one I shared to the young people where I was hiking up in the Monterey area. That's back when I was really into fitness. I was running cross country and track in college, and I went running up this mountain region and decided to climb a mountain for some stupid reason. Young men do things like that. And I'm walking up this mountain and I'm up there at the top enjoying God's creation. And the sun began to set. And I was uh, a little concerned that I would not be able to get down off of that mountain by the path that I had come. And I wasn't fam- I'd never been there before, wasn't familiar with it. And, you know, logic and you know, reason jumped in and something said, you know, you really should be heading back down. If it gets dark up here, you're in trouble. So in my haste to get down, I took a different route down. I didn't take the long winding route. I just went straight down. I went uh, with 
jagged edges and so forth. And I, was, I was coming down, you know, the side of this mountain where the rock edges were. And, and anyway, I slipped, a, a rock broke out from under my foot. I slipped and I fell back and I was in my mind, everything was in slow motion. I thought I was gonna die. I thought I was gonna fall several feet, at least break my back, maybe break my head open. I wonder how long it take them to, I didn't tell my sister where I was, I visited my sister. I didn't tell her where I was. I just went outside to go jogging around and I saw this mountain and said, I'm gonna go jog to the mountain, go climb the mountain. I don't know if they would have ever found me. I might have been there, my remains might be there today if it wasn't for God's intervention. On this rocky hillside, at some point, somehow, perhaps a bird brought a seed on its feet or whatever, something blew up there. A seed lodged between a rock and a little sprout grew up and, it, and that, tr I call it a tree, is about six feet tall. The bottom of it was at the most that wide around had been, had been uh, lodged and growing in the side of rock. No dirt, just rock. And you think even then you could just break it right off. I fell back and felt that stick give way and it sprung me back up. And I turned around and looked and it was that, I didn't even know that little sapling was there. And when I got down and looked up, there was no other saplings on the whole mountain. Just that one. And it, and it held my weight when I fell back. And uh, I was shaken. I was like, I just thought, that's a God thing. That is a God thing. I, who knows how many times in your life God has spared you, and he spared you for a purpose. We are all here to give glory to God with our lives. Amen. And I think the great majority of things that have happened in our lives miraculously to spare our lives are undetected. We don't even know the ways that God has spared our lives and what he's done to us. But, uh, you know, ben Haydad might have used this opportunity as a way to get serious about this God of Elisha and to stop pursuing them, but he didn't do that. God always protects us. And um, no danger will come upon us unless God allows it to. You need to remember that. We need to understand the nature of life. It presents challenges to us, and we, we're not all on an equal playing field. Okay, I'm just going to be honest with you. Some of you had, have greater hardships than others. Some of you will go through more difficult times than others. Some of you will have unthinkable, unbearable things happen in your life, and others of you will go through life with rather smooth sailing. And that's not always a result of your own decisions, by the way, just the way this is the course of life. I, I sometimes I look at people and see what they're going through and I don't understand why that's happening with them. I don't understand why, the, you know, like Job. Job's a good example, right? Job was a righteous man that honored God and loved God, but he went through these un, unthinkable uh, uh, difficulties in his life. So much so his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? Like it can't get any worse than this just die and be done with it. And we know from the context of the book of Job that none of that was a consequence of Job's bad decisions or his sinful behavior. God allows difficulties in our lives and he knows what we can handle. And he's molding us and shaping us in the course of that difficulty. And if you're gonna go through life thinking that we're, we all should get equal treatment, you're gonna be disillusioned. You're going to go through life and think that, well, I'm, I'm going through an inordinate amount of difficulty in my life. Something's wrong with me or something's wrong with God or something's wrong somehow. You're going to be disillusioned with life. You just have to understand that God deals differently with different people and hope and pray that uh, you can weather the storms that God brings into your life. And have, uh, that being the case, the point four is that we need to remember that it's, it's wrong for us to presume upon God's protection and goodness in our lives. When, when he spares you, when he blesses you, when, he, when you look at others who are going through a difficult patch and you don't have that situation in your life, you better stop and, and put life in perspective and praise him and thank him that God has spared you the very same difficulties that you are trying to help your friends or loved ones to go through. Don't presume upon that. Don't think that you deserve better treatment than anybody else. Because we don't. We absolutely don't. And, and if things are going good for you now, don't forget to stop and praise God for the, for the smooth times in your life, the times of peace that, that you know, Jehoram had. A wicked, a wicked, godless king had a period of peace because God closed the eyes of the Syrian army and let his, the man of God lead them right into the camp. And when they went back home, Ben-Hadad said, we better lay low for a while. Now, I'm, I'm going to share with you that that didn't last permanently, but at least for the time, 
he enjoyed a measure of peace in his life. And if you are in that period and patch in your life where it's kind of peaceful or things are settled, you better stop and put that in perspective and thank God for that. And if you're going through difficulty, thank God for that too. Because he's chosen that for your life at this time for a purpose. And ultimately, our protection comes in undetected packages. Not just those angels unaware. Uh, sometimes our protection comes in, in ways we don't imagine it's going to come. Can we not all look back on our lives and witness times when we wanted to do something and we chose a path of life and God closed the door? I mean, he, not to just close, he didn't just sort of slowly, he just slammed it shut. And given the choice, you would have gone through that path of life. But God shut that door and you're looking back now and you're realizing, wow, if that, God didn't close that door for me, who knows where I'd be today or what I would be today if he had not closed that door. Sometimes God will use unusual circumstances to lead us and direct us and guide us in our lives. And we should respond to those times. I think there are angels that may uh, watch over us in those, in those uh, emergency situations. And I'm thankful for it. I'm convinced. I am absolutely convinced that God has intervened in my life and saved my life more than once. Physically, my physical life. But probably the greatest work that God has ever done in my life is leading me in the more important areas of my life, not my physical death or, you know, survival. It's been in those areas of life that I would have pursued, and God said, no, that's not my choice for you, child. And he, and he closed that door. And so grow to appreciate those times. Amen? Now, that's just the end of last week's lesson. Now I have five minutes to teach this lesson this week. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 6 and pick it up in verse 24. And I've entitled this... Uh, this lesson, hurt people, hurt people. That's one of my favorite expressions. Hurt people, hurt people. We're going to see that truth evidenced. You know, look, at, look at verse 24 of chapter 6, and we'll read down, well, we'll read down to the end of that chapter. And it came to pass after this. Okay, so Ben-Hadad, when his armies came back, there was a re reprieve. He, he stopped pursuing the, uh, the nation of Israel for a while. We don't know how long. But at some point, it came to pass that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. Samaria, as you may recall, is the capital city of the northern kingdom. That's where Jehoram was stationed. That's where he lived. That's where the palace was. And there was great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Hope none of you have that on your menu for this afternoon for lunch. That's what they were looking to eat. They were in a destitute situ situation. And as the king of Syria was passing by upon the wall, Jehoram, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? So he was thinking that she wanted some food. She was, they were starving. Come on. The people were starving in the city. They were eating dung, dove's dung. I raised pigeons for a good part of my years growing up. We had pigeons, and I can just tell you there's nothing appealing about the dung of a bird. Or, or the donkey's head, by the way. Apparently, they, they ate the rest of the donkey. Things are so By the way, the Jews would not normally eat their donkeys. They didn't, like, raise donkeys to eat. It just shows that everything else was gone. They were, so they, they cut off this donkey's head, ate the rest of it, and now the head was left, and they were paying top money for a donkey's head. Can you even imagine? Uh, we went, any of you, where any of you men, uh, Randy probably was, I know Brother Luis, how many of you, how many of us are left? The men that went with us on the trip to Gallup, New Mexico to see Brother Forrester, uh, did Brother Randy, did you, did you make that trip? To, oh, you did make that. Brother Luis, did you make that trip? Did any, any of you, John, were you there on that trip? Philip? Oh, wow. Tom, you didn't make that trip either. No. We went to, the men, men about uh, 20 of us, went to Gallup, New Mexico on a men's mission trip. It's a wonderful experience. And we got to mix with the locals, Indian, Indian people. And Brother Forrest is doing a, still doing a great job there as a, as a minute, you know, home-based missionary there to the Navajo Indians. And I went with another man in the church to go visit some people. And I got up to this uh, guy, this old uh, Indian guy. He is, 
um, let's just say, how can I say this delicately? Um, he did not place an emphasis on oral health. I Meaning he was missing a lot of his teeth. You know, he just, this guy up there, he's, you know, he's good natured and he true Indian, Indian setting there. They, they didn't have a front door in their house. And their house, he told me, had to be set a certain way that the house had to be facing a certain direction in relation to the sun. A lot of superstition and so forth in regard, regard to the people there and the Indians on the, on the reservation. And I got to go in and visit with him a little bit. And he invited me in, very gracious. And we sat at the kitchen table. And he had something there uh, that he was not prepared for our visit, but he was being hospitable and invited me to uh, indulge in his food while he entered while we spoke what was on the table was a platter with a goat's head now i wanted i wanted to let you know it wasn't as bad as some of you are thinking like i would have been out of there pastor um it was the 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 goat they ate the goat and they cut off the head but they boiled the head removed the hair the the hide from it and it was just a, the skeletal part of the goat goat's head with them with whatever meat was left and apparently they keep it for more than one day and they just stick it back in the pot and boil it again and stick it back out. And they sit. It's kind of like it's kind of like, Pastor Joel to be like chips and salsa. It's like chips and salsa. It's like it's like ch chips and salsa. Like it wasn't the meal. It wasn't the meal. There wasn't much meat on a goat's head, but it was, like you know, offering refreshments. So um, I didn't know exactly what, how we're going to do this, but he just sat and talked and he just invited me and. What they did is apparently just reached over and picked pieces of the meat off of the goat's head and ate it. And I was like, well, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? I, I thought it would be unhospitable of me to not, you know, accept his kindness in this gesture. So I began to eat little pieces of them. And, I, and I'm, I'm thinking about the meat, but I'm trying to have conversation with this guy, you know, and, and and eating this, and, and, and uh, as, it, as it turned out, the missionary told me, oh, you didn't, you didn't have to eat that. You wouldn't have offended him. I said, now you tell me, you know. He said, he said did he offer you any blood sausage? I said, no. What's blood sausage? He said, oh, well, don't, don't want to eat the blood sausage. I mean, as if the goat's head's okay. <laughs> don't eat the blood sausage. That could be unsanitary, you know, but I'm thinking. Anyway, I, I, uh, I told my wife about that. She didn't kiss me for a week after I got back from my missions trip. <laughs> Uh, when I told her about how I had been eating meat off of a ghost head. But can you imagine this donkey, donkey's head, the big old eyes and everything, and they were paying, paying good money, by the way. <laughs> the donkey's head sold for four score pieces of silver. Isn't it funny? Money means nothing when you're in a crisis. Money means, they'll pay whatever it would take. And that would factor into the other part of the story that we'll look at next week that the fact that, you know, the, everything is relative, right? And these, these pieces of silver for a goat's head, that's how desperate it was in that city. Where did I stop off reading? Uh, oh, they, oh, this lady. And the king said unto her in verse 28, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give me thy son, that we may eat him today. That's exactly what it is. And we shall eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, give, give thy son that you may eat him. And she hath hid her son. Smart woman. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. And he said, God do so and more also to me. Look at his response. If the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. Well, we're going to pick up this story. A very, very interesting um, scenario. I want you to understand the deep desperation that the people found themselves. And I want you to, I will share with you next week a principle that happens to most of us, if not all of us. When we get desperate, when we go through hard times, we often seek to attach blame. Unfortunately, in many cases, the blame should be attached to ourselves. In this case, it should have. But Jehoram didn't see it. And he, he, when, when he attached blame to Elisha for everything that was going on, as if it was Elisha's fault, it, it, proved, it proved the statement that hurt people hurt people. That's exactly what happens. Father, we're